Hi, this is Hank Hill. When I am not selling propane and propane accessories, I listen to Paramania Radio on ParamaniaRadio.com. Damn it, Bobby, put that back on Paramania Radio. You are listening to Paramania Radio. Tune in to the Chris and Wayne Show every Thursday night at 8 o'clock on ParamaniaRadio.com. Hop aboard the haunted ship of doom and join Captain Chris. It was the government secretly outside of the studio. Skipper Wayne. I think it's time you get the Kraken out of your butt. Deck wench Joe. Yeah, I got stuck on the corner. And of course, cabin boy Todd. <laughs> oh, look where I'm sitting. And always remember our motto, don't just listen to the mayhem, be a part of it. In the mall, during church. Do you have trouble keeping your pants on? Do you crave that glorious feeling of escaping the confines of leg tubes and butt barricades? There is a place you can go. Welcome to the No Pant Zone. The first Friday night of every month at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Only on Paranomania Radio. The No Pant Zone. Freedom, oh sweet freedom. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Paramania, its affiliates, or its sponsors. You are listening to Paramania Radio. The Parasearch UK Radio Show with your hosts Kerry Greenaway and Jay Lynch, right here on Paramania Radio. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Parasearch UK Radio Show. Hi, Kerry, how are you? Uh, hi, I'm just gonna Jay. jump right into it this week. How I do? like that. I'm just going to jump right into it this week. I'm not going to go get my normal spiel. Oh, go on then. <laughs> I did. Hi, Gary. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good, thanks. You? I see, I see Luke Walker's in the chat room already with us on Facebook. Hi, Luke. Hi, Luke. And Max has joined us on the Paramania page. We're, we're, we got our normal uh, weekly show uh, subscribers. <laughs> we, we certainly do. Good evening, Max. Um, wow. What a show we've got for you tonight, guys. Exactly. Go on. We have, uh, Introduce well, we, him. Let's get we straight actually to it. On a, yeah, straight to it. We're really on a nice gentleman. Uh, I've not had the pleasure of meeting in person. We have talked on the other on with me and Teresa on sit chatting after lunches. Uh, me and him, have, what, probably about a year now. We've back and forth on Facebook and Instagram and things like that. But uh, we'd like to welcome Katie Stafford to the show. How are you tonight, Katie? I'm pretty good, Jay. How are you? Same as always, getting in trouble. Yeah. Yep. As usual. <laughs> Well, somebody's got to do the dumb things. I seem to be good at it. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, I'm definitely good at it. <laughs> Actually, we've been sitting there looking at your uh, the the little bio that you gave us and stuff, and and seeing that you've been uh, involved with the paranormal since 2006. Yes, 2006. Uh, I'd say 2006 because that's when I started recording EVPs and. Um, I actually worked. I worked in a uh, a warehouse where the owner had died of a, of a heart attack, and so everybody always said the building was haunted. I worked third shift, so you know I was like, "Well, let's see." So, and that's when I got. That's when I officially started. I've always kind of been into it. So, you did you have some kind of experience like most people, or you just kind of. I- Something as you got older, you just kind of got an interest in. I mean, was it something that draft draw? Kerry, take over. I can't even talk. It was more. It, it was more skepticism that was the reason why I got into it. You know, 
I, I was a skeptic. I was a, a, a of course watched Ghost Hunters when it first came out, but before that, I used to like that show Sightings, and you know I read everything I could get my hands on that had anything to do with the unusual and or the weird, you know, because uh, when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet, so uh, <clears throat> I read books. My grandmother had these books, and can't remember what it was, what they were called, but it was uh, it was like an encyclopedia set of weird stuff. So I would read those uh-huh. books over and over, and you know, just always had a general interest in it. Okay, so you got into the paranormal field um, through that method. Now, it's the tech side that you're drawn to the most, isn't it, in the paranormal at the moment? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, I've I've kind of gravitated towards the ITC um, and uh, electronic, you know, voice phenomenon and and um, well, what I I call ghost radio. I mean, it's not necessarily EVP. I mean, we kind of have to break it down, I guess, at that point. So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the radio side, I, I focus on a lot. And, um, but also, you know, I, I remember it as a kid, um, reading an article about, uh, Dr. Michael Persinger and how, and the God helmet. And that's, uh, I saw something recently, well, not recently, a couple of years ago, about it again. It reminded me. And so then I started taking that approach as well, you know, on that side of the tech side instead of just radios. Okay, so do you have a background um, in in electronics? You know, that's, that's the funny thing. I really don't. <laughs> I'm a... I'm a mechanic. I'm a diesel mechanic by trade, and uh, well, now I'm a, a maintenance technician. I work on um, industrial equipment in a plant, but um, I uh, never really had a background in electronics specifically, you know, other than the vehicle electronics, you know. Um, but yeah, I never really had until about three years ago, and. I don't know. I, I can't even put my finger on what it was exactly that that sparked that interest. But um, yes, I, it just kind of came on. As I, I guess you could call it a, a calling. Okay. So, what was the first piece of technical equipment that you um, wanted to try and improve? That would be the ghost box. Um, all the ghost box, well, the majority of the ghost boxes that I'd seen and used, uh, the SB7, which is a great tool. I still use it today. But, um, you know, all the all the digital scanning radios, they, they had this, this electronic quality to it. And, and I had, I'd say my theory of how ghost radio works is different than a lot of people's. Um, I don't. I don't believe that they're just using little snippets of sound here and there, and, and somehow forming that into a sentence or, or a word or a response. I feel like it's they communicate somehow over the um, the radio spectrum, you know. So, um, so I, I wanted to improve on that, and so I think the first the first thing I actually built was a um, analog sweeping radio it's um it's not digital at all it's it used I, I used antique radio equipment and um a uh, server or servo uh controlled by a microcontroller that had been programmed um to make it sweep 180 degrees across the radio band and um I've had some really good results with that, and I still, I still have, I still build radios like that today. So, okay. So, out of that improvement that you made, are you getting um, oh, clearer communication? Yeah, I, I would say, I would say clearer. Um, sometimes with the the analog. It can go either way because the, uh, I also have a digital 
sweeping radio that I developed that's this pretty good too. Um, so I, I'm not ruling out digital sweeping radios, but the analog it it, it takes away that that um, mechanic or that, that that digital sound, you know, the, the clicking and um, it's just kind of a smooth sweep through. So I don't know if you have you've ever heard of a um, there was a um, Italian uh, per, uh, an Italian man named Bocci. His last name is Bocci. Yeah. And mm-hmm. he, yeah, so you heard about, okay. So he, you know, that, that's kind of where I got the analog sweep fr- idea from is because, you know, you watch him and he just kind of tunes through the radios with his hands. But I wanted, I wanted a autonomous way to do it where it kind of took, took the, uh, the human element out and, uh, to see if it would work that way too, or if it, or if it necessarily needed his interaction, you know, almost like a, channeling or something yeah and i understand what you're talking about with that and um, for the people out there who don't know who bocce is can you um could you explain that a little bit more for them please yeah i'd appreciate that yeah oh okay <laughs> all right well so ooh, that was a crazy sound what was that <clears throat> that was me trying to laugh and <laughs> cough at the same time it's all good man i'm not dead <laughs> okay. i'm still here you guys don't have to investigate for me was, yet yeah, I thought we were getting some um, some paranormal activity here. I was ber- about to break out the equipment. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so Bocce, well, you know, back a few decades ago, um, there was this big ITC craze. Craze it seemed like in um, in Europe, and um, so Bocce actually had he he became uh, famous for being able to tune in uh, the relatives of loved ones who would come and basically uh, want to speak to you know their husband or whoever and so he had this um, shortwave radio that he would sit there and just turn the dials on it and. Um, clear voices would come through, you know, for some reason. And um, there, there's lots of rumors as to, as to you know, it, if it was as on point accurate as as, they, as people claim it was. And, you know, I'm not necessarily an expert on, on, on that whole side of it. That's, I think you'd want to speak with Tim Woolworth about that. But, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but basically that, that had a, uh, that had an influence on me to start with the radios. And also uh, the, if you've heard of the Spectrecom or, or the, yeah, yeah. The Spectre, uh, no, is it Spiritcom? Spectrecom is the radio that I was going to make. But yeah, the Spiritcom. Um, have you guys heard of that? Yeah, I've no, heard of it. I haven't heard of that one. Well, that one was an interesting one too. Um, that, there was a uh, retired engineer, and I think it's, I want to say his name was Bill O'Neill. Don't um, quote me on that right away, but he uh, he basically built this machine that he claimed he could communicate through, you know, with the dead through, and um, he kind of he found it. Up, he found it, it was like a metaphys- metaphysical foundation that he actually started. And he started doing all this after after he retired. But he used a um, a system that played. I think it was thirteen different tones, and um, he would broadcast those over an FM uh, transmitter across the room to. Uh, radio receiver and then that would play in another room and be picked up by microphone and it was a whole complicated system but basically there's a there's a video on youtube where you can go and and watch it and you know there's debate on whether he um hoaxed it or not but it does kind of like one of those um those voice boxes you know for that you Put to your throat when you after you have uh, like throat cancer or something. 
So it sounded really robotic then. Yeah, yeah, it sounds kind of robotic. And it's, but, you know, there's people that they claim that everything was legit, so who am I to say? But anyway, that, that idea kind of also aided in um, my quest to build a better ghost radio. Not not to say that I have built one better than anybody else's, but mine, mine are kind of unique. No, it just sort of led you down that pathway, didn't it, to look into these things and uh, see if you could incorporate um, other methods perhaps to get a better response. Right. You had, uh, oh, like oh, breast cancer, cancer or something. <laughs> Trying to get on here so I can see the feed. See the chat room. Okay, yeah. so... Oh, uh, it's I quite. It's, when there you're talking go. like this, it's quite complicated because we're talking about radio frequencies and stuff like that, aren't we? Yes, and, and you know, I'm I'm not I'm not even a radio like like I, w- I wouldn't consider myself a radio expert. I, I have I have friends who are really good at it. You know, they, they could they could sit down and build a radio circuit from scratch. My 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 experience with it is more manipulating existing radios. Uh, but you know, I, I have built, built the radio recently. I came up, found a pretty useful way of, uh, building a, um, digital scanning radio. Uh So in your opinion, um, is analog better than digital? Um, it depends. Now, I, I like I like the analog shortwave scan. I think shortwave is very interesting, just simply because of how it how it works, you know, um, and and how it works better at night, and that just kind of goes along with the whole paranormal thing, you know, and, and uh, the idea of ghosts and uh, some ghosts or spirits are seem to be powered by the night or darkness or whatever so and uh shortwave radio actually works better at night it bounces off the ionosphere and you can actually listen to to, to stations from all over the world if you know okay so So, (coughs) excuse me um i in the uk i don't know if this happened in america so bear with me on this thought Um, I know aerials change from analog into digital, um, so everybody had to change their aerials, basically. Um, Since that happened, did that happen in in America for a start? Uh, Not completely. You're talking about, like, the, um, the, the, I can't remember what it's called, uh, digital radio, basically. Yes, it's digital FM but it's digital. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to affect it. Um, for some people, it probably won't because, you know, like I said, they believe that, um, that spirits are able to just manipulate the sounds, little snippets of sound here and there. And that's why you have a lot of, um, phonetic generator type, um, ghost communication, apps and stuff like that it was spit out little random bits of voice and and supposed to form into a sentence or a word or whatever but um in my opinion doing away with the the broadcasting it through the air you know like the old traditional you know i prefer am actually am this seems to be the more legit um way to pick up why do you think that is well okay so that goes back to tesla for me (laughs) i read an article about that about tesla a long time ago and it it was was talking about how he heard voices uh he would sit there and listen to his radio and he had this really awesome and basically, the only radios they had then were, were crystal radios, you know, like germanium radios. Or mm-hmm. actually, they weren't. They didn't even have germanium diodes at that point. Had they had these 
really cool little detector diodes, and they were they were called cat whisker diodes, and it was this little mechanical setup. And you use a, a piece of a, some sort of mineral like um, the Galena stone, for example, because it had um, properties that would that would modulate the, the AM radio signal. So, um, so anyway, he he had this really elaborate like spider web radio antenna, and you know he would sit there and listen to radio basically before there was there's radio shows or anything you know so he's listening to just i don't i'm not even sure what he's listening to (laughs) but just static i guess but um (coughs) uh, excuse me he basically said that he heard voices and it sounded like they were speaking in different languages sometimes and but but he was convinced that it was extraterrestrial where you know I believe that was potentially something from beyond what we understand, but I didn't know. Can I put my finger on exactly what it is we were talking to through the radio? No, I can't say for sure. Who really knows? Who knows indeed. Right, I want to get you onto the um, the God helmet, um, which was originally built by the neuro uh, sorry the neuroscientists. Michael Persinger and Stanley Karen. You read the article of this, yes. didn't you? And this really interested you. Yes, that that uh, I found that to be extremely interesting. And here's why: it's okay. So they basically developed this helmet to disprove um paranormal experiences or you know um the the euphoria or whatever that you would experience during during a god experience or people seeing images of jesus or or whatever experience they may be having so uh, i found it interesting that they had such great results and and you know that they but they felt that they had disproved paranormal activity and by simply saying that oh well if we do this to your brain with um electromagnetic field then this will call induce a false hallucination you know of of this experience and what instantly i i thought well what if you're not actually inducing a, a false experience what if you are actually rewiring these people's brains to um, to see things that they wouldn't normally see? So that's kind of how I started. I started wanting to apply that to the paranormal field because, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's more experience based. Uh, it's not like you it's, you're not going to capture scientific evidence of ghosts with by using the um, ghost helmet because. You know, it's it's all about a personal experience at that point. But um, yeah. Okay. Well, the what they how they did this was they uh, manipulated, like you said, by electronic pulses on various temporal loads throughout the brain, didn't they? Yeah. The well, they, their theory under was controlled that they, under controlled experimental conditions that's that's the point of that one oh, it was very controlled wasn't it yeah. yeah well they they say it was very controlled um and and i agree it probably was for the most part they and they even went uh to links as great as um they had a walk-in faraday cage that the person and it was a sound booth and a faraday cage basically um because part of their experiment was also sound deprivation. That was important to them. Um, but they wanted to also shield uh, the person that's wearing the helmet during the experiment. They wanted to shield the area around them from natural or uh, other man-made um, low-power magnetic fields also so they could probably so they could isolate it 
and 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 get the best data as possible. So yeah, they they were pretty they used pretty strict methods. I I think. I agree. Now it's controversial as these experiments are, um, but they came up with some interesting results with this, didn't they? Oh yeah, they definitely did. Um, they tried. They tried a lot of different things. They they tried sound deprivation. They tried, um, um, you know, the the Gansfeld effect, basically with ping pongs over your eyes, and and um, also sound. And that was the Gansfeld and, experiment. Well, they, they they tried that coupled with it with the uh, mm-hmm. God helmet, and mm-hmm. they also they also. Uh, they would play like some sort of trigger music. Um, like they would play the sound of monks chant, Tibetan monk chants, or, or or the sounds of war, or you know just different sounds to that would provoke different emotions and stuff. So uh, yeah, they they tried a lot of different things, um, and they did. They had a lot of different experiences. They uh, some people would see God, <clears throat> and it <clears throat> seemed that the more religious people would have a experience where they would see, you know, their their uh, God, whoever their God was, based on their religion. <clears throat> and um, some people would say to see Jesus, but then some people would say that, it, you know, they they would see their uh, relatives, or they would just sense someone standing in the room by them. Um, or um, yeah, so there was there were lots of different results, and then there were some people who didn't respond to it at all. That's true. It was a, if you have, if you don't know about that particular experimentation, it's well worth checking out because it is absolutely fascinating. But it definitely led to the um, assumption should we say that the brain is more capable of producing these kind of um experiences than you would think right and and i i uh, I agree that um someone can definitely have a false experience from the correct you know, just the, if, if they somehow are introduced to just the right magnetic fields and, and um, to their brain, yeah, it, it could it indeed, you know, create a false uh, uh, experience. But yeah. um, also, you know, being a paranormal investigator and taking it from this angle, I'm, I'm not really taking it. <clears throat> It's a science angle, and you can't, you, I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot of paranormal investigators that are out there to just. They say they want to prove that ghosts are real to science. I, I find that to be a waste of time, especially right now. Because, and for probably a hundred years, I don't. I don't believe. You know, anything will. Nothing is paranormal to to science. Um, so I, I don't. I'm not big on wasting my time doing that. <laughs> so I look for. Uh, so just like I would any other, um, at any other paranormal investigation, using any other technique, I use multiple things to validate um, activity. Right. So someone's wearing the helmet, um, and there's a spike in EMF while they're having an experience, or. Um, whatever, or, or somebody else not wearing the helmet also has an experience, or uh, you get a uh, ghost radio response uh, that validates something that you experience while wearing the helmet. For me, that's enough to say that those particular experiences aren't just random hallucinations. Okay, so where you've developed your own type of um, God helmet, haven't you? <clears throat> yes, I, I, I call it ghost helmet. <laughs> um, okay, it's it's yeah, it's definitely based on uh, Michael Persinger's um, design and his idea. Well, just Steve, uh, Steve Corn or Stanley Corn. I'm sorry. Um, based on their idea, but. Uh, 
way it works, I believe, is a lot different. <clears throat> See, it's not, and it's not just firing an electromagnet, you know, a certain voltage just over and over and over and spinning around in a circle. You have an, an array on each side, and they're moving in a specific pattern. And one is firing, and then another firing, and then another firing, and it just goes around in a circle. And um, so now what they did, Michael Persinger and uh, Stanley Gordon did, was they used complex magnetic fields, complex wave waveforms to create complex magnetic fields. And uh, a complex waveform is basically like a square wave in electronics or electricity. It's, it's um it's it's a um like a level of power. It's you hmm. can you can yeah, it's hard for me to explain. <laughs> but um so that's all basically the same. But I also added something else too. Um there's some research done and I can't tell you off the top of my head which I wish I could. Uh, the, the university that did the research, but they found that um, they could flash lights at the free at the frequency that your brain operates at during different meditative states, and um, they could flash those lights at you at that frequency, and it would cause you your brain to kind of sync with those lights, and um, kind of put you into that specific meditative state so okay. i like that idea yeah, okay go ahead. i'm sorry no no um carry on oh i was just going to say that uh so the, the leds i decided would be a good addition and you know try it out uh see if that would cause that it would give a different level of realism or something to to the uh, ghost helmet and it actually does I, I mean I've, I was surprised at the results of it myself I, th I thought you know um, I really didn't because I I've, I've never been one to believe that I, that I personally could be hypnotized or, or whatever or somehow manipulated mentally but um, it, it, when you put that helmet on it's, it's kind of a different story <laughs> okay, so knowing that both the concepts that are in your helmet are a, a, a causation and effect, so you're you're creating an effect by oh, how do I explain it? How, I know what I'm trying to say, but I don't, may not be saying this correctly, everybody. So bear with me on this one. So knowing that you okay. can influence the mind or the brain with these um types of experiments like you know the god helmet and the uh flashy light meditative state thingy don't take terms everybody you flashy know what i'm light. like you I'm know what that. i'm like with tech terms <laughs> okay knowing that you can influence i'm so sorry my tech terminology <laughs> is not very good i will warn you um well, knowing you good. can affect the mind with those kind of um, experiments, what I don't understand why you would want that effect in the why you would take that out of a, a scientific research because surely it's proving that we can have an influence on the mind to create an experience. Not it's the mind making that experience, oh. not an external force creating that experience. So basically what you're saying, like I, always, like I always see, are we experiencing manifestation or are we manifesting the experience? Yeah, exactly. But I don't understand well, why you would well, try to manifest that for yourself in the paranormal field. And I don't understand how you could do that and collect data from that that would be useful in in regards to the paranormal environment. That's the bit I'm struggling with well, this one. No, it's okay. I, I think I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> okay, so um, I, I, I believe that those that the experiences that people experience. Uh, okay, now 
Here, here's an example of um, of why I don't believe that the that hey, hey. the majority of the halluc- oh. hallucinations that uh, that people have that are caused by electromagnetic fields. Here's why I don't believe that they're necessarily false experiences. Um, okay, there was there was a story. Uh, I think I saw it on a documentary uh, where there was a scientist. He, he worked in a in a lab, and um, he was in his he was um, he was like a professor. So he had other scientists that you know the students that work for him. But he was in the lab late one night, and he noticed something out of the corner of his eye, and it was a gray. He said it looked like a gray figure of a like a partial apparition of a person walking towards him. And so he turned and looked at it, and he still saw it. And as it got closer to him, it faded away. And he, of course, was a complete skeptic and, and uh, a non-believer. And he automatically said, well, what, what could have caused this to happen to me? Well, he couldn't figure it out. So the next day, the next night, he was the same thing happened to him. And so... Then he started asking his his, his uh, students and uh, coworkers, and apparently other people had experienced the same thing sitting in that same spot. So, um, so they did a little investigating. They written and they found that there was a, uh, a, a it was a huge motor, electric motor, for some sort of scientific equipment that they had just installed upstairs and it was producing this electromagnetic fit, this really powerful electromagnetic field that, you know, and so they believe that that powerful electromagnetic field caused by this equipment was causing everyone in that area to experience hallucinations. Well, but here's my question. How do you know that it was actually a hallucination? And how do you know that your brain just wasn't being, the synapse fire, firings in your brain weren't being rewired in a certain way where it allowed you to see something that you wouldn't normally be able to see? Uh, this isn't, this, it's not science fiction. I mean, it's, we, do it, we do it every day. They're, they have a, what they call it, transcranial magnetic, yeah, magnetic stimulation. And uh, yeah. so they treat depression with this. They treat uh, all all sorts of illnesses with it. And um, so um, it's it's not out of the realm of belief, in my opinion, to think that you're not actually having a hallucination. I just I just don't see how a hallucination could be so well organized like that, just caused by a random powerful electromagnetic field right so when you apply these these um special complex magnetic fields to your brain and um now even in the location where they did most of their testing dr Persinger, you know even at that lab um who actually knows what this spirit world their boundaries Uh, you know some people believe they can come to you wherever you're at or whatever so uh, just because they had these experiences in a lab doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't actually experiences that they were induced hallucinations I I would think that um, more common effect from electromagnetic fields strong electromagnetic fields would be um, like a high sense of um, paranoia or fear or um, because that's that's also been studied as well but for me to, to for a magnetic field applied to your brain to cause people to see so many things that are are similar and have similar experiences, but then some people have completely different experiences, which, um, you know, that's, that's another, that's another radio show right there. Um, but 
who's to say that these experiences are in fact hallucinations okay well i i believed that the world health organization had looked into the um general impact of electromagnetic fields um in the environment on a day-to-day basis and they they had very inconclusive results that it had an effect on anybody's physical or mental well-being whereas with this particular experiment with the god's helmet it's a very specifically targeted field on the temporal lobes isn't it yes it is it it actually focuses on um the the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe it it rotates the field across those two portions of your brain the center of your brain because they they believe uh, anthony or um uh, michael persinger and stanley corn they believe that that's where the your the center of your your spiritual experience that's where that that came from okay well there were other reported visions not just god um allegedly there were also visions of demonic beings out of body experiences visions of other realities um and other paranormal experiences it says here um but the journalists and the media obviously picked up on the most sensational one which was the god hence why it got the name the god helmet um now definitely yeah um so it it didn't just create images of god it did create a range of other experiences from the from oh, yeah. the um people that were tested on it so i just wanted to get that clear um but i think what it was yeah. i think what became clear was the effect it had on the brain which now that's why i query its use in regards to the paranormal field i think in a lab it shows very good indicators that the brain can be manipulated into experiencing some form of paranormal activity so we go back to the brain producing those um experiences for people uh, right okay so which is but not necessarily having an outside influence well uh, well uh, there's an old saying that perception is reality so uh-huh. you know, what ha- if what happens in your brain is real to you then um but it somebody else just didn't experience it that doesn't mean that you didn't experience it you said it's kind of like uh that i like to i like to look back at that that scene in the matrix where um the agents are talking to one of the uh the humans <laughs> and uh He's telling him, you know, he, he's he's eating steak, and he says, you know, I know the steak is, isn't juicy and, and and tasty. I know it's not real, but you know, it's still good, right? He still liked it. Mm. Uh, so that that kind of that kind of goes along with the way I feel about it. Like, um, it, it that it's there's been a lot of work done with like uh, psychedelics, even you know, like. Um, experiences that people have on that and is that real uh you know it boils down to the human conscious and what we experience is it if it was real to you or not and um mm-hmm. uh, oh so I, that, I don't that, disagree that, that, i don't disagree with that point a personal experience is a personal experience and nobody can take that away from you um but we want right. to try and um prove or, or find a way of acknowledging or recording that particular personal experience, not yeah, try no, that, to that, that, create that, the experience. Yeah, that that would be a, that that would be a really great um, addition. But unfortunately, like you said, it's it's really hard to record that personal experience while you know while you're you're the only one experiencing it. So, yeah. yeah. No, I see what you're saying. As far as, as far as the data gathering tool and to, to build a case for, uh, paranormal activity. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be, that's, that's what 
that's why I said earlier, it's not going to be anything where it's going to prove to science that, that goes surreal or anything like that. It's more of a investigate. And when I say an investigative tool, I mean, when we go, when we go out to locations and we do paranormal investigations, um, the majority of my work is communication and, um, I want to understand better. So, okay. um, in my opinion, that's kind of my, the ultimate way, the, the best way for me to be able to see things that I couldn't normally see. Um, cause I, I don't know if you put any stock in, um, psychic phenomena, uh, or mediums, but, <laughs> um, if, if there's uh, anything well, to that and do it now, you, you got her on that one. Cause, uh, yeah, I'll just shut up. I care. <laughs> Are you a skeptic, oh no, Carrie? we're not talking about me. We're not no, talking no, she's about nowhere, me. No, no, she's She's nowhere near a skeptic. She's uh, amazing with with stones and crystals, and she has her own amazing gifts oh. as it is. Anyway, so you're you're along the lines that might oh, be more okay. in tune with what she understands. Well, actually, she understands more about what you've been talking about for the last half hour than I do. So that's right. why I've been quiet, and that's, that's, listening and learning. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of why I, that's 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 another reason why I sort of started leaning towards the helmet um, being actual, actually being able to produce results that are, I, I hate to say that are real, but, but that can be validated by uh, people with psychic abilities like uh, mediums. Um, we have an intuitive on our team, Renee Rao, and she, she's amazing. She does. She's, she's awesome. Um, I've seen her hit the nail on the head lots of times. And, um, you know, there's, there's been times where either I have worn the helmet or someone else has worn the helmet and she's validated what they've experienced. That's, so is that that's kind of, well, that's interaction? That, that's what I was kind of getting ready to go ask with, but, with Carrie is, 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 is if this helmet can create people to be able to see or to tap into so-called their third eye and see more – I would actually now be able to wear that helmet and be able to see what you and, and Teresa and, and, and Scotty and I can just keep naming them, Vanessa, all these other uh -huh. gifted psychics and stuff. That would actually give me a physical way for me to be able to experience that. Or am I looking at it differently? Right. That, and that's kind of the way I, I feel about it, Jay, um, because I was always so jealous that, you know, these people – and I was extremely skeptic of, of psychic phenomenon. Um because I, I couldn't experience it. You know, I can't experience it. It's like telling some of these people that, you know, no, well, I won't go into the whole flat, flat world thing, but anyway, Ooh, so, no, don't go there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so it's like, it's like explaining something to somebody that they can't, that there's no way that they're going to be able to, to experience, I guess, like it's uh, like if I was blind and someone was trying to explain something that they were looking at to me, then it's really hard for me to relate to that until I can see it myself. So uh, that's kind of another purpose of me developing the helmet is to so I could see the same things you guys see. So pretty much to put put a normal person, or, or no, I, I shouldn't say a normal person, a non-gifted person into a hypnotic state or a mental state to where we're going to open up and be able to experience what they already are experiencing on a daily basis. Exactly. <clears throat> See, I find it interesting that when uh, you would say you were wearing the helmet and then the psychic medium was able to pick up what you were seeing through that, that, that interests me because that – indicates in a telepathic interaction not necessarily a real experience happening maybe well the, the validation the validation was more <clears throat> like she wasn't actually here at the time when i was wearing the helmet i was i, I actually was wearing the helmet i had just uh put on some new additional coils for the frontal lobe and uh so i was sitting in my bed just I work third shift, so I, I usually go to bed about noon or one. So I was sitting in my bed just kind of doing my wind-down thing, and I figured I'd put the helmet on 
and try the new coils out and see if it made me want to throw up or anything because that's not good. And uh, so I put it on and I'm sitting there and it's, the room's completely dark. And then I see the silhouette of a woman. Um, I couldn't make out her facial features or like any details of what, of, you know, what she was wearing because it was a silhouette, but um, basically I could see the outline of her hair. I could tell she was wearing some sort of gown. Um, her hair was kind of disheveled and, and, and she was kind of short and hunched over and she was in my room and she sort of glided to the foot of my bed and it freaked me out so bad. And I'm usually not one to just get freaked out. Um, but it freaked me out so bad. I grabbed the helmet and I just threw it because, um, you know, it was like, wow, this is in my house. Um, and then I thought, and then I, you know, I kind of started taking your, um, approach. Well, maybe, maybe that was just a, a false experience induced by the electromagnets. Well, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. So Renee comes over and she says, you know, there's a woman in your house. And I'm like, and I haven't said a word to her or to anybody else. Um, so she says, you know, there's a woman in your house, right? And I'm like, really? What's she, uh, what's she look like? She's like, well, she's not allowing me to see her face or any details about her, but I can see that she's just wearing like a, like a gown or an apron or something like, you know, like a, she said it was a muumuu or something like that. And, um, medium length and she she described exactly what i had seen and you know it's funny because she's been over at my house lots of times and you know she's never said anything about that before but just a, the day after was actually the day after i had that experience she comes in and says that she had seen this entity that i also saw in my house so for me that that kind of that kind of sealed the deal for me. And that's why I kind of, that was my go ahead to, to try and have some other paranormal researchers use it also and see if they could, uh, you know, I'm game. Much. Well, bro, I'll I get, send you one. I'll send you one. I, I get my ass out your way, man. I'll let you film it. Whatever you want to do. We'll do all kinds of experiments. Yeah. I'm your paranormal crash test. dummy. let's give this thing a shot. <laughs> Be my paranormal penny pig, guinea pig. Hell yeah, I'm I'm so, all, I'm all for anything that's going to try to get the experience and 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 see if we can't progress something in the field because to me, so many things are being stagnated right now that we're just taking the same piece of equipment, making it another shape, giving it another flashy light, making make another beep beep, and it's a new piece of equipment for four hundred dollars, and that's not doing anything. Right. It's, it's not progressing the field, in my opinion. So to see somebody willing to open up the Pandora's box, for lack of a better term, and push to another level in another direction. I'm all for it. Let's see if it works. If it don't, we'll go another direction. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I don't see how we we wouldn't believe that uh, paranormal activity has everything to do with our our own human conscious. I mean, because that's exactly and our own perception. Most of, right. Right. It, right. And so, um, yeah, I definitely believe there's something to it. And and um, I'm gonna keep working with it. So, I've been looking at all your other devices, like like you see, you talk about the uh, the the ghost box, spirit box, radio, hack shack. What do you? Oh, what, yeah. what name should you give it? Those are di a little different than what's out on the market right now. They're actually going back to some of the more easier, uh, less technological, more practical forms of of usage. So, I try them. I, I'd, I'd love to work with them. I'd like to see you putting some more stuff out there on film and stuff where you are using them getting that interaction stuff because the analog one will not have the digital interference like everybody cries about the other ones. So you can film it with Facebook right. Live or something like that and show it out there because it's not going to have that digital interference. I, go for it, man. If you want, I will. I'll work with all you want to. Oh, I don't yeah. give a crap. They can they laugh yeah. at me if they want to. I'll put the helmet on and go crash into a wall. Okay. <laughs> Quickly before we go because we're running out of time rapidly. 
Um, I'm so okay. sorry, Max. I've seen your questions in the chat room. I hope they've been answered naturally through the conversation. One last question. Yeah, no, I'll um, that too. Yeah. yeah, I do apologise, Max. Um, has there been, I just want to have a look at this one, has there been any determinations of the long-term effects of this kind of work in regards to the brain? Um, no, I don't, I don't believe, that, well, I'm pretty sure, now don't quote, again, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that we have, or the scientific community has come to the conclusion that simple, just electromagnetic fields uh, aren't destructive to the brain. They're actually beneficial in a lot of ways. Um, now, there are some types of EMF that are dangerous for the brain, obviously, uh, radio, RF, you know, um, but simply electromagnets, uh, low intensity electromagnets, because we're talking about 50 to 100 milliga- milligauss is what um, I'm measuring using my tri field on it, on my helmet. So, um you know, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation uses way higher, uh, more intense fields than that. So um, I'm pretty sure that science has kind of become okay with it, with um, okay. with that. I know. Obviously not like have, cell phones, don't... like cell phone signals and stuff. Or, that's a different type of EMF. So, yeah. That, now that's don't you have a YouTube channel for... with some of this stuff on it? I do. It's 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 very sad and poor and pathetic, but <laughs> it's uh, but people it's want people's anyway. got questions now. How can they get a hold of you to answer these questions and see what you're talking about? Well, the best the best way to to uh, see what I'm doing and, and talk to me is on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, on Instagram, I'm Supernatural Inc. with a K, I N K. Um, on Facebook, if you just search uh, Supernatural Inc. Paranormal Investigations, Kansas City. There we are. And cool. We got less than 30 responsive. seconds, man, so we got to be going. So I do appreciate it. I hate to cut you off, but we got less than 30 seconds. Thank you for coming on, Carrie. Thank you. No, thank you so much, KD. Thank you for being so um, candid with your answers. Um, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Y'all don't go anywhere. Stay, stay right where you're at. Listen to the Chris and Wayne Show coming up very next. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.